Regiments of the Imperial Guard. Citizens of the Imperium, the following Imperial Guard regimental histories are to elucidate the role and purpose of the forces of the Imperial Guard in all its many and varied forms. Most forms, of course, involving las guns. To that end, today we will be exploring a number of regiments with very different cultures and methods of war. Uh, some more well-known than others. Where pertinent, I have included some information on homeworlds and culture, as well as some of their more famous engagements. Before we begin, however, I would point to a previous Vox cast, which can be considered a companion piece to this. Uh, the location is included in the details of this transmission, as well as on the screen, now, hopefully. The history of the Sabbath Worlds, a tremendous, if I do say so myself, historical series chronicling in extreme detail the actions of this great crusade to liberate the Sabbath Worlds cluster, uh, mostly conducted by the forces of the Imperial Guard, with a focus on the Tanif first, and only, but also highlighting dozens of other regiments is well worth checking out. I will also direct you to another previous Voxcast, as sent out for the edification of the plebeian masses of our Holy Emperor's Domain, like yourselves, covering the histories of the Mordian, Talan, Katachan, and yes, it's pronounced Katachan, and Valhallen regiments in detail. Whereas here, we will simply be covering some of these regiments' more celebrated engagements rather than repeating ourselves. And so, without further ado, the Mordian Iron. Guard. The defense of Barbarossa. In 796M41, the Imperial Hive World of Metrolis was invaded by the forces of the Orc Warlord known as the Great Despot of Dragrook. Luckily for the Metrolesians, the Great Despot's Horde and landed over 200 leagues from the principal hive, Barbarossa. The Greenskins set about conquering the neighbouring hives in their drive eastwards, across the Ash Dunes. Four other hives stood between the Despot and Barbarossa, and at each city the Greenskins met staunch resistance. As the length of the Orcs' march stretched from days into weeks and then into months, a regiment from Mordia, only 15 light years away, was mustered and arrived in the Metrolis system. It was decided that Barbarossa must be held at all costs, and the Mordian Third was stationed at the capital, ready to fight alongside the local defence force and a rough militia conscripted from the most vicious hive gangs of the area. Ash nomads were also pressed into service, and did an admiral job of waylaying and stalling the orcs' advance even further, allowing more time for the defence of Barbarossa to be prepared. It was as the bitter winter began to set in, with icy dust blizzards scouring the dunes, that the great despot's armies fell upon Barbarossa. For all their ferocious temperament, the Hive Gang militia was quickly overwhelmed as they defended the lowest levels of the Hive against the Orcs. In the close confines of the cramped tunnels and chambers, the short rangers favoured the Orcs more than the human defenders. Gradually, the Orcs began to work their way up the Hive, slaughtering the defence personnel as they attempted to stem the flood of greenskins into the industrial levels of the spire. It then fell to the Mordians to protect the uppermost reaches from the screaming hordes of the Great Despot. They barricaded several of the major access ways, guiding the orcs into a wide plaza known as the Marble Gardens. There, amongst the many statues of great heroes of the past, Around the tinkling fountains and across the imported Luptetian bluegrass lawns, the Mordians steadied their firing lines. The orcs broke into three parts. One came straight at the Mordians, whilst the other two split to the left and right, attempting to encircle the Iron Guard. Volley after volley of Laz gun fire flashed into the orc ranks, accompanied by the roar of heavy bolters and the thunder of auto cannons. Orc killer cans exploded into flames as beams from las cannons crisscrossed the spacious park. The frontal attack was stopped dead, 
while the left flank of the Mordians managed to stem the tide of greenskins trying to attack around that end of the line. On the right, however, lightning-fast attacks from orc light vehicles and storm boys crashed into the Mordians, shattering their formations and punching deep in behind their rigid firing lines. It was then that Colonel Gruer uh, committed his reserves. One company of Hellhound flamethrower tanks and a demi-company of Lehman Russ exterminators. The armoured vehicles raced into the fray from the Marble Garden's main zoom through. Uh, the guns of the exterminators blazing, each fusillade uh, cutting a bloody sway through the tightly packed orcs. The Hellhounds crashed into the orc ranks and dozens of greenskins were consumed in the conflagration. As their death howls screamed over the crackling of flames, the Orc Horde began to fall back from the fresh onslaught. The Mordian infantry then responded, advancing by platoon to pour more fire into the retreating Orcs. Those few Orcs that survived fled to the deepest reaches of the Hive, and to this day there are regular fire sweeps of the lower levels to ensure that they do not once again grow sufficient in number to threaten the hive. Baizra Keep The agri-world of Baizra lies some 75 light years to the northeast of Mordian. As well as a few local ranger forces, Baizra was protected by a company from the 11th Mordian Regiment. The company was broken into several garrisons, ranging from individual squads billeted in the few settlements on the world uh, to the whole of 4th Platoon at Baizra Keep, the planet's only fortress and spaceport. It was with their customary suddenness that the Eldar attacked, a small force of the aliens dropping virtually on top of Baizra Keep. Their surprise attack almost took the Citadel at the first assault, uh, before any message could be sent to the Keep's astropath. However, a valiant last stand by the platoon's third and fourth squads, who died to a man, held up the Guardians and Aspect Warriors long enough for the Astropath to project a distress call into the ether. For several hours, the platoon held the Bastion walls, stirred to marvellous acts of valour by the example set by Commissar Dower, the brave Commissar, who single-handedly slew a squad of striking Scorpion Aspect Warriors after Lieutenant Large and his command section were killed. A true hero of the Imperium. He later fell whilst hurling himself at the Cabal of Warlocks, leading the Eldar attack. His power sword is now preserved in a stasis chamber in Bizar Keep's armory. The time earned by the valiant defense of the Keep was used wisely by the rest of the company across Bizra who mustered the local militia and saw the farmers and their families safely ensconced in bunkers constructed to protect the inhabitants during such an attack. It also gave Imperial Commander Horn time to escape in a shuttle with his family and aides, as is only right. The Talan Desert Raiders The Battle of the Broadsword One of the Talan's most famous victories in a large engagement was during the Chemos Rebellion of the late 38th millennium. One of Chemos's lords, Duke Mormont, had overthrown the rightful Imperial commander. With Talan located only 10 light years from Chemos, it was unsurprising that the bulk of the Imperial Retribution Force sent to quell Duke Mormont's uprising came from there. Six full Talan regiments were sent to eradicate the forces of the usurper Duke combined with three Commotion Royal Guard regiments that remain loyal to the exiled Imperial commander. Duke Mormont uh, wanted to demonstrate his total rule of Chemos and gathered his forces, some 30,000 men, upon the plains west of the capital of Chemos. Amongst this number were several dozen large artillery guns, which far outmatched anything the Talan could bring. However, the Talan did have a sizable force of Rough Riders, giving them a distinct advantage over the infantry arrayed before them. The battlefield Mormont chose was the ground between the confluence of two rivers, known locally as the Broadsword due to its long pointed shape. For a whole day, the armies marched to their chosen position, no more than a mile from each other and in plain sight of their foes. 
That night, the campfires blazed across the tongue of dry land, and the picket sentries could hear the calls of their opposite numbers. A Duke Mormont began his attack just before noon, and for the next four hours, his army advanced on the Talan positions, which came under a constant pounding from the Camosian big guns. After brief skirmishes, the Talans would fall back from the enemy attack. As General Akia of Talan had planned, the rebels' pursuit left them more and more strung out and isolated from their supporting formations. A couple of hours before sunset, Akia counterattacked. He formed over half of his companies into one unstoppable division that crushed each of the enemy formations piecemeal. At the same time, his 3,000 Rough Riders encircled the Commotion's left flank and pounced on the artillery, cutting down the gun crews and setting them to rout. The cavalry then smashed into the rear of the remaining Commotion companies, who were caught between the chainswords and flailing hoofs of the Rough Riders and the volleys of Lasgun fire from the Talans. The firing became so fierce at one point that the grass caught fire and the battlefield was swathed in thick black smoke, choking the soldiers of both sides. As Akir's infantry and tanks pressed forward, the renegade's retreat became a full rout. Within a matter of days, the few remnants of Mormon's rebel army was entirely stamped out by the pursuing Talan. Lorenz's Grave Diggers As well as infantry, artillery and armoured companies, it is not uncommon for Talon regiments to include one or more patrol companies, sometimes referred to as recon or long-range companies. The first of these was an ad hoc formation created by Captain Lorenz of the Talon 16th whilst fighting the Eldar on Holon Prime in 762-765 M35. The unwieldy Talan companies were having great difficulty dealing with the speed and flexibility of the aliens they faced, and by the time they mustered their forces to respond to an attack, they arrived too late. It was Lorenz who took the Armoured Fist squads from four of the other companies and asked the tech priest to strip down the armour on their chimeras. This gave Lorenz's raiders a transport that could carry them quickly across the dunes. Other vehicles had a tendency to get bogged down in the sand flows, but which still boasted a powerful armament. Many of the other officers laughed at Lorenz's plan and called his formation the Grave Diggers after the skeletal appearance of their vehicles. Lorenz did not mind this at all and claimed that it would be the Eldar Graves they would be digging soon. Cope. The first test of Lorenz's idea was to be a raid on an Eldar position many leagues from Talan's defensive boxes. The desert offered little in the way of cover, so the 16th had created protective boxes with razor wire, trench works and bunkers. Lorenz and his men set out just after nightfall and took a circuitous route to their objective, at Rocky Valley, where orbital augers had detected the heat auras of several Eldar vehicles. As they neared their target, the gravediggers used improvised means to muffle their Chimera's engines as much as possible. From the eastern ridgetop, Lorenz was glad to see the outlines of half a dozen Eldar grav tanks, two of them the formidable Super Heavy Scorpions, with Lorenz leading in his half-track staff car, the gravediggers set off down the slope. They were barely 200 yards from the Eldar sentries when the alarm was raised. Lorenz shouted the order for a full-speed attack, and the Chimera's engines roared into life, hurtling across the open ground due to their light weight. Uh, Multi-lasers and heavy bolter fire filled the air, and three of the Eldar vehicles were enveloped by flames and smoke before the gravediggers reached them. Spilling from their chimeras, the Talan began setting melter bombs to destroy the remaining tanks. But as they moved between the hovering vehicles, the surviving Scorpion sprang into life and lifted off the ground. The massive Pulsar atop the super heavy tank opened fire on the Talan, a devastating blast of laser energy tearing craters into the packed desert floor. Seeing only one chance, Lorenz leapt back into his staff car 
and directed the driver to steer under the Scorpion. As they passed beneath the immense war engine, all that could be seen was the continuous flash of the vehicle's pintle heavy bolter. With a strange slowness, the Scorpion began to tilt sideways, its anti-grav engines disabled along one side. As it crashed into the desert floor, Lorenz and his driver raced from the billowing clouds of smoke and dust. Their mission complete, the gravediggers leapt into their chimeras and sped off, leaving only four of their number dead. Lorenz's continued attacks seriously hampered the Eldar army, forcing them to keep units in reserve to combat his rampaging patrols. This denied them forces which they sorely needed for the main battles, and in the end, the Talan's superior numbers proved decisive. Since Holon Prime, the first patrol company of the Talan 16th, has always been known as the Gravediggers. The Valhallen Ice Warriors When the Expirators of the Adeptus Mechanicus discovered the Poretta system in 365M40, they thought the Machine God had answered their prayers. Of the system's five worlds, three were inhabitable by humans, each with mineral-dense mountain ranges ripe for exploitation. Unfortunately, upon closer investigation, the tech priests found that someone got there first. Their first landing parties were attacked by a race known to humanity as the Demiurg. These squat semi-humanoids normally drifted through the galaxy on gigantic asteroid harvesting ships. However, the ore contained within the young worlds of Peretta was too much of a prize to be passed by, and they had landed their ships and started mining. The Demiurg had adapted well to the conditions on Peretta IV, the largest inhabited world, and though the Explorators had nearly 5,000 Tech Guard with them, they suffered heavy losses trying to capture the mountain passes occupied by the Demiurg. Magus uh, Strixter, in charge of the Explorators, sent word for a force of specialist mountain fighters. Almost six months later, they were joined by two Valhallen regiments raised from the Polar Guard, Ice Rangers, brought up from birth in the precipitous mountain ranges of southern Valhalla. The Valhallen Polar Guard regiments, first and second, quickly established a landing zone in the foothills of the largest mountain range, where the Demiurg were most heavily concentrated. They pushed inwards along several mountain valleys and met with slow but steady success. Their superior numbers, combined with specialist mountain equipment and weapons, allowed them to push the Demiurg further into the jagged peaks. After two months of fighting, they came across a major valley that stretched for nearly the whole 700 miles of the mountain range's length. The Demiurg had built their stronghold at its northwestern end, a bunker complex hewn into the rock with heavy weapons towers covering the approaches along the valley. Commander Yurov of the Polar Guard 2nd was in charge of the assault. After a sustained orbital bombardment from the Adeptus Mechanicus's fleet and the Navy transports that had brought the Valhallans, Yurov's Polar Guard attacked. The regiment was broken into three detachments, the largest consisting of four companies pushed forward along the main valley floor. The second battle command of three companies attacked from another valley to the west of the Demiurg's position. Finally, a single company of elite Valhallen mountain rangers was to scale the cliffs and ridges to the north of the Demiurg and attack the aliens from behind. The rangers were under the command of Alexei Rosko, a grey-haired captain with 50 years mountain fighting experience. Rosko and his men faced a fearsome prospect, scaling several cliffs, one of which was nearly 300 feet high in the face of enemy fire. While the heavy weapons squads provided covering support, the rangers started to tackle the steep slopes, their mountain guns able to fire accurately at high trajectory, but light enough for easy movement, laid down a barrage that kept the Demiurg sheltering in their bunkers. Only sporadic small arms fire troubled Roscoe's company as they swiftly climbed towards the first of their objectives, a heavy weapon post that was raining fire down upon the companies attacking from the west. Once they had reached the summit, the rangers swiftly overran the Demiurg weapons crews, killing half of them 
and taking the rest prisoner to be dealt with later. Having taken the promontory, the rangers used lightweight block and tackle to swiftly move their heavy guns from their original position to the captured summit, from which they could target the main Demiurg defences another 1,000 feet above their position. With barely a pause to help the weapons teams establish themselves, the rangers moved on to their main objective, a secondary gateway into the Demiurg complex. This time the Demiurg were more tenacious in their defence and had recovered from the orbital bombardment. Many rangers were wounded by the concentrated heavy weapons fire as they struggled up through the snowdrifts and across treacherous ice sheets, clawing their way forward with ice picks and spiked boots. Roscoe himself was hit twice by enemy bullets, but refused any medical treatment, claiming it was just this skirt you do, and that there were men in more dire need of attention. Eventually, Roscoe's rangers attained the Poston Gatehouse and fought hand-to-hand with the Demiurg. The grizzled rangers finally ousted the tough Demiurg from their dug-in positions, but were unable to force their way into the heavily armoured bunker entrance. As the main attack force of the Valhallans reached the main gate of the complex, Roscoe saw an opportunity to end the battle swiftly. There was a route open around the very tip of the mountain, above the Demiurg bunkers, which would allow his men to attack the defenders from behind their in-place defences. However, if a sizable force was to sally forth from the Poston entrance, it would be his men that found themselves caught in a trap, leaving a platoon of his fiercest fighters to hold back any counterattack by the Demiurg. Roscoe led his men on the relatively easy climb to a ridge overlooking the alien's base. The Demiurg did indeed launch an attack from the rear gate, but the ranger's platoon stationed there fought valiantly to keep the Demiurg pinned down within a few hundred yards of the gatehouse. Roscoe's plan worked perfectly. Faced with the superior numbers of the Valhallans and taking heavy casualties from Roscoe's men, occupying a superior and unassailable position, the Demiurg had no option but to surrender, although the stubborn aliens fought for another hour to preserve their highly developed sense of honour. Nearly two-thirds of the rangers had fallen in the assault, and almost half of the other companies. However, with their main stronghold lost, the Demiurg could no longer supply their other outposts. The Demiurg eventually abandoned Poretta, and the Valhallans were given the privilege of founding the first imperial settlements in the system. A true honour. Katachan Jungle Fighters Like all worlds within the Imperium, Katachan is required to provide troops for the Imperial Guard. The people of Katachan live amongst dense and dangerous jungles, which are altogether alien to most of the hive-dwelling citizens of the Imperium's larger worlds. When it comes to jungle fighting, the Katachan Regiment has no equal, and the Imperial Guard recognises their supremacy in this type of warfare. During the jungle wars on Epsinoctorus, the Katachan Regiment survived for nearly 40 days amidst crotalid infested mangrove swamps before reaching the Orc Gargan construction site of Grubneck's Drops. On that occasion, the savagery of the jungle fighters so impressed the deaf skull Orc warlord that he ordered his Gargans to be painted in green jungle stripes with red bandanas in imitation of the Katachan jungle fighters' uniform. Whether he did this out of respect for his enemies or in the hope that some of the jungle fighter's skills would rub off on his gargant fighting machines, is uncertain. The jungle fighters wear the green combat gear that is everyday costume for the people of Katachan. Their clothing is perfectly suited to fast-moving warfare amid steaming jungles. Combined with the red bandana, this rough but practical costume passes as the regiment's uniform. Crossing the Zanges. The Zanges River stretches for over 4,000 miles across Metapa 4. It was during prolonged fighting against a force from the Iron Warriors Traitor Legion that the Katachan 6th Regiment, the Cobras, had to force a crossing against very stiff resistance. The Iron Warriors were falling back from the rapid advance of the Ryzen 9th Armoured Regiment and had destroyed the bridges along their line of retreat. It would take several weeks for the Imperial Guard to redirect their offensive 
along the surviving bridges. Colonel Corps of the Cobras volunteered his regiment to take a position along the Zanges and held it long enough for the engineers of the Ryzen 9th to erect a bridge for their tanks. The attack began at last light, with three companies of Katachan infantry wading across the shallows of the Zanges near the Matapan Massif. The first platoon had almost reached the far shore. The river was some 300 yards wide at that point, when the rearguard pickets of the Iron Warriors force spotted them. Bolter fire tore through the air, but the Katachans bravely pushed forwards, taking heavy losses. Supporting fire from the Risons was erratic due to the darkness. Corps had deliberately chosen an overcast night to mask his crossing. The Katachans soon found themselves facing numerous Iron Warrior tanks, most notably half a dozen predators. Again, they took heavy losses from their armoured enemies, but the infantry bravely held on until their own anti-tank and fire support squads could be ferried across on makeshift rafts. With their heavy weapons in position, the Katachans began to take a heavy toll on the Iron Warriors, constantly moving through the darkness to ensure that the renegade space marines were unsure of their exact numbers or position. The Katachans held off three counterattacks over the next 18 hours, while the Risons constructed first a pontoon bridge and then a more sturdy span. At first light the next day, the Matapa night was some 20 hours long during this season, the first Risen tanks began to rumble across the Zanges, allowing the Iron Warriors no chance to regroup and form a proper defensive position. The war lasted another three months. It would have been considerably longer, if not for the sacrifices the Cobras made on that bloody night. The Battle of Hell's Mount During counter-rebellion activities on Seduja Minor, the 3rd Company of the Katachan 152nd Regiment, known as the Screaming Devils, was ordered to take an enemy-held position within the tangled jungle valleys of the Sierra Peaks. The enemy was well dug in, with a network of underground bunkers and tunnels allowing them to move around the mountainside beneath the surface, avoiding the reconnaissance and bombing runs of the Imperial Navy aircraft that patrolled the skies overhead. After a preliminary attack by Stratocraft and artillery, the Third Company began to fight their way up the steep slopes, made all the harder because recent rains had turned the jungle floor into a quagmire of mud and rotting leaves. However, using their lifelong training and knowledge, the Katachans managed to work themselves into range of the rebel position with minimal casualties. A prolonged firefight then ensued, and eventually it was Lieutenant Foley who led the second platoon on a direct assault, using his flamer-equipped squads to push the traitors back into their underground warren. Vicious tunnel fighting continued for almost an hour, until explosive charges were used to collapse many of the chambers, forcing the rebels to the surface once more. Here they were easily gunned down by the Katachans, whose superior field craft allowed them to kill many times their own number. To the locals, the mountain is now known as Hell's Mount, in reference to the raging fires and billowing black smoke that engulfed the crest during the fiercest period of fighting. The Armageddon Steel Legion The Chaos Wars the orc invasions of Armageddon were not the first time that the planet had been attacked. Five hundred years before orc warlord Gaskell Thracker was born, Armageddon faced no less deadly a threat, but from an entirely different enemy, the forces of chaos. Within the Eye of Terror, the forces of chaos are constantly at war with each other. On occasion, however, the followers of chaos put aside their personal rivalries and joined together to mount a large invasion. Sometimes the assembly of such an invasion force will be triggered when a space hulk drifts near to a planet that is in thrall of the Chaos Gods. These ancient spaceships can be used to transport vast armies through the warp. Driven and tossed by the currents of the warp, no one can predict where or when they will reappear, least of all the warriors inside the space hulk itself. Usually the attack occurs within a few hundred light years of the Eye of Terror, but sometimes the Hulk will drop out of the warp thousands of light years away. Such was the case with the first invasion of Armageddon. Travel to the planet had been disrupted for several months by severe warp storms, 
and the resulting food shortages caused much suffering in the overcrowded hive cities. As the situation worsened, feelings of discontent grew into outright revolt. Food riots became increasingly common, and finally, in M41474, armed rebellion broke out in half a dozen hives. The revolts were quickly put down on Armageddon Secundus, but amongst the more scattered hives of Armageddon Prime, they proved more difficult to eradicate. However, with the situation stable on Secundus, additional Steel Legion forces were sent westwards to help crush the revolt on Armageddon Prime. No additional troops were sent to the planet by the Administratum. After all, Armageddon was a very long way from the Eye of Terror, and no one suspected any more sinister cause for the revolts than civil unrest, a distressingly common occurrence on hive worlds like Armageddon. So it was that the Armageddon Planetary Defense Force was fully occupied dealing with the revolt when the Space Hulk Devourer of Souls, escorted by five World Eaters battle barges and a full Chaos battle fleet, appeared in the Armageddon system. On board these ships was a vast Chaos host, led by the demon Primarch Angron. He was the first Primarch to join with Horus when the War Master turned against the Emperor at the start of the Horus Heresy, or so the Church teaches. Angron supported the War Master in demanding a new order of discipline and martial virtue as the only way to save mankind from destruction in a hostile galaxy. He and the World Eater's legion of space marines that he commanded had always been warlike and savage. Before long, they were seduced into giving their fealty to Korn, chaos god of war and bloodshed. Thus were they damned for all eternity. Twisted, and horribly mutated over the centuries. Angron became a hulking giant with skin the colour of spilt blood. He continues to serve his demonic master Korn, smiting his foes with a mighty chaos blade of black glowing iron, etched with runes of doom and destruction. With Angron's arrival, the insidious effects of chaos were quickly felt as nearly half the local hive defence forces on Armageddon Prime joined the revolt and went over to the invaders. The rebels immediately attacked the continent's planetary defence batteries, capturing or destroying over 90% of them, and allowing Angron's demonic host to land almost unopposed. Chaos space marines from the World Eaters Legion and hordes of demonic creatures poured from the Space Hulk and swept across Armageddon Prime. Although three regiments of the Steel Legion joined with the forces of Chaos, The vast bulk remained loyal. Even so, it was obvious that the battle for Armageddon Prime was already lost. So the Planetary Defense Council ordered the surviving Imperial forces on Armageddon Prime to fall back to Armageddon Secundus. The retreat was a nightmare. Although the Steel Legion was fully mobilized, the troops that made up the loyal Hive Defense units were not. These poorly equipped troops, many of whom had never in their lives left the hive of their birth, were forced to trek hundreds of miles across the hostile ash wastes of Armageddon. To make matters worse, the retreating columns were harried every step of the way by Angron's forces. Although the Steel Legion did their best to cover the retreat, they could not be everywhere at once, and entire hive defence regiments were lost to surprise attacks launched by the World Eaters, or Angron's foul demonic followers. Tens of thousands died from exposure to Armageddon's hostile elements or attack by Angron's forces. By the time that the troops reached the relative safety of the jungles to the south, only one in five was left alive. Nonetheless, the presence of the Steel Legion had stopped the retreat from turning into a total rout. Time and again, a beleaguered Imperial force was saved by the timely arrival of a flying column of Steel Legion guardsmen in their Chimera armoured vehicles. As the last survivors of the Hive Defence Forces limped into the jungles, they were still guarded by the Steel Legion. It was during the long, terrible days of the Great Retreat from Armageddon Prime that the Steel Legion earned their motto of first to battle, last to retreat. Falling back through the jungles, the survivors of Armageddon Prime joined up with the units that had been 
left on Armageddon Secundus and prepared to make a last-ditch defence along the River Styx and Caron. The Imperial defence lines were well organised. Unknown to Angron, three great companies of space wolves under the command of Logan Grimnar were on Armageddon. They alone may have been enough to make the difference between victory or defeat, but the defenders also gained valuable time when Angron, replete with success, wasted weeks building monuments to his Lord Corn instead of pursuing the shattered Imperial armies into Armageddon Secundus. Angron's failure to follow up his initial successes cost him dear. It gave time for Battlefleet Armageddon to arrive to contest the space lanes that the Chaos Fleet had controlled since they arrived. More importantly, when Angron's army emerged from the jungles that separated Armageddon Prime from Armageddon Secundus, they found the defenders ready and waiting. At places, the Imperial fortifications and trenches were over 50 miles thick, while Armageddon's formidable industrial capacity had been placed on a full war footing, producing arms and armour at an unprecedented rate. By the time Angron attacked, all the losses which the army had suffered had been made good, and nearly two dozen new Steel Legion regiments had been raised and were ready to fight. Titanic battles erupted all along the river defence lines, as the forces of chaos crashed into the Imperial defenders. On the banks of the river Charon, the Imperial defenders held, and chaos was hurled back in disorder. But further to the west, Angron led the attack personally, smashing deep into the Imperial lines, and leading his forces towards Infernus and Hell's Reach hives. It was at this moment that the Defence Council played their trump card. A full company of Grey Knights, whose assistance had been requested as soon as the Council were aware of the dangers that faced Armageddon. Only the Grey Knights had the ability to truly defeat an entity such as Angron. They arrived just as the Chaos Army reached Infernus and Hell's Reach hives, teleporting directly into the presence of Angron at the centre of his demonic host. The Grey Knights defeated the Demon Prince, hurling his spirit back into the warp from where it did not reappear for over 100 years. At the same time, the Steel Legions, spearheaded by the Space Wolves, launched a massive counterattack into the flank of the Chaos Army, which had been exposed in their headlong rush towards Infernus and Hell's Reach hives. The Imperium's armoured columns dealt the overextended Chaos forces a decisive blow. Reeling from the shattering attack, confused by the loss of their leader, the minions of Chaos attempted to fall back, but found that they were already surrounded by the mechanised units of the Steel Legion. Unable to retreat, the Chaos forces were cut to pieces by the victorious Imperial armies. Only the World Eaters managed to retreat back to their battle barges and escape to the safety of the warp, harried all the way by the ships of Battlefleet and Armageddon. The Imperial victory was complete and overwhelming and firmly established the reputation of the Armageddon Steel Legion as one of the Imperium's greatest fighting forces. Little did anyone suspect that a far greater test would await the Steel Legion in the future. For Kurslat Early during the Second Armageddon Campaign, Imperial units were ordered by Von Strab to launch counterattacks against the overwhelming Orc forces. The attacks were disjointed and poorly conceived, and led to many fine formations becoming cut off and surrounded by the Orcs. Ordered to counterattack and cut off the Orc spearheads, the 9th Armageddon Steel Legion, under the command of Colonel Kerslacht, had already punched its way deep into the gap which exposed the Orcs' flank. Kerslacht's regiment forged on, seeking a point for their breakthrough to the north. A weak spot was located during the night, and the defending orcs overwhelmed, creating a corridor which led across the Infernus Hive, or Archeron Hive Highway. Uh, Kerslacht now turned southwest, uh, moving virtually unopposed along the highway towards Infernus Hive. Von Strab had promised Kerslacht that the corridor would be shored up properly with three Imperial Guard infantry regiments. But almost at once, Orc units attacked the flanks of Kerslak's corridor and shut it tight, sealing Kerslak from the main body of the Imperial forces. Much of his artillery and rear service organisation was thus abruptly 
and disastrously snatched away from Kerslakt, who now found himself isolated deep behind the Orc lines. The three late-arriving guard regiments were hurled into assaults on the newly established Orc lines in an attempt to break through to Kerslakt, but these attacks were also stalled. Kerslat was now ordered to turn about and aid in the attempt to break through the Orc lines. The 9th Steel Legion was operationally encircled, their gaps sealed behind them by Orc assault units, and conditions were growing worse every day. Already Kerslat had 270 wounded men and 150 men infected with Armageddon lung rot. Several days of heavy fighting brought no breakthrough, only serious losses, and the dispersal of the Imperial attackers. Kerslak's 7th Company became doubly encircled and had to fight its way out to the main group, now pushed back some 14 kilometres from the Orc front line. On the other side of the Orc lines, the 11th Armageddon Regiment and the 114th Pyran Dragoon Regiment went into the attack, but neither made much headway against heavy fire from Orc lobbers and zappers. At night, the Orc bombardment continued as Orc fighters and fighter bombers dropped flares and then bombed the garishly illuminated targets. While these attacks were going on, Kerslacht also helped the remnants of the 81st Armageddon Assault Legion, landed from orbit in a suicidal bid to recapture Infernus Hive to battle their way out of encirclement. The members of the 81st Regiment that managed to escape amounting to barely a company in strength under normal conditions, were subordinated to Kerslak's 9th Regiment. As well as members of the 81st Regiment, the 9th was joined by large numbers of citizens from Infernus Hive who had escaped the Orc attackers and were now also trapped behind the Orc lines. Many of the Hive dwellers were armed, either with their own or captured weaponry, and Kerslak requested permission to recoup his manpower from these partisan units. Kershlat was authorised to mobilise hive gangers and civilians of suitable character and moral fibre, an assignment handled by the commissar officers from his regiment. The commissars quickly directed several hundred men to the 9th Regiment. At the front line, Imperial forces prepared one final throw, by which the 50th Regiment would attempt to break across the Infernus Archeron Highway and link up with Kerschlacht, attacking from the rear of the Orc forces. Only a narrow corridor separated the 9th from the 50th Regiment, but it was packed with strong Orc units, ready to face a front and rear strike. The following report by Kerschlacht shows one action he contemplated. Strength of regiment and length of front oblige me to attempt to break out rather than continue offensive operations to the south. Initiative visibly with the enemy. No reserves. In such conditions suggest offensive plan. 1. To break encirclement ring to meet 50th Regiment in general direction of Archeron Hive. 2. To this end, to concentrate assault force of 1st and 2nd Companies Armageddon Steel Legion, elements of 81st Mobile Assault Regiment and Partisan Detachment Zabo. 3. Attack with above force aided by 50th Regiment units and possibly 10th Regiment to seize the old motor road in the Xanthon Heights sector. Thereafter to dig in on motor road in indicated sector. 4. After my link-up with Colding, commander of the 50th Regiment, to bring all my regiment and other assigned units and drive regiment across Xanthon Heights to join with 3rd Army Front or for other assignment. Kerschlack's plan was a good one, and would have worked. Disastrously, however, the attack was held up for several hours while von Straub dithered as to whether to give permission to carry out the operation. By the time he consented, further Orc forces had been brought up and Kerschlack found himself under attack from the south, while at the same time trying to break out to the north. The northern assault went well, breaching the Orc lines as planned and linking up with the 50th Regiment along the motor road. To the south, things were far more desperate. Kerschlack personally led a fighting withdrawal as the 3rd and 6th companies valiantly tried to hold up the orcs long enough for the rest of the regiment to escape. Slowly giving ground, the two companies mounted a tenacious defence, using their chimera transport vehicles to fall back to a new defensive point each time the orcs closed in. Only half a mile separated Kirschlag from Baldin's regiment when the orc fighter bombers caught them, blasting forge units of the 50th regiment off the Xanthon Heights 
and flaying the third and sixth companies under Kirschlach's command. This small force was now systematically and literally cut to pieces. Kirschlach himself was severely wounded when his command HQ was caught by an orc assault. With Kirschlach dying, his much reduced force practically ceased to exist in its last desperate push to cover the few hundred yards to the Imperial Army lines. Kirschlach, unable to help his men and unwilling to die a prisoner, whispered, Boys, this is the end for me. Would you go on fighting? At that, he shot himself in the temple. Although the actions of the Nine Farmageddon Steel Legion had done little to slow the Orc Juggernaut, thanks to Kirschlach's inspired leadership, the bulk of the regiment had managed to escape to fight another day. When much later in the campaign, the tide turned and the Orcs were driven back, the Ninth Regiment was there, its men bellowing their battle cry for Kirschlach. The Six-Hour Revolution Tithed regiments from Armageddon have served in wars all over the Imperium. This is an example of how the presence of a single Armageddon Steel Legion made a significant difference to the outcome of a war. In M36776, the 16th Armageddon Steel Legion was on the planet of Cassel. It had been stationed there following its participation as part of General Belov's 3rd Imperial Guard Army in the Lothurn Campaign, where it had served with distinction. Castle is an agri-world, which was ruled at this time by the followers of a local imperial cult known as the Way of the Emperor's Flesh. The leader of the cult, the Supreme Pontiff Scalin, had long been noted for his eccentric views, but had to this point been a loyal and reliable governor of Kessel for the Imperium. Worrying reports, however, had reached the ear of Colonel Kleist, commander of the 16th Steel Legion. These reports concerned rumours that the Supreme Pontiff had been becoming increasingly outspoken in his belief that the cult over which he ruled was the one true cult of the Emperor and that the rest of the Imperium had to be made to acknowledge this fact. Loath to act without hard evidence, Kleist put the 16th to combat readiness and requested permission from the Administratum to investigate the rumours he had received. Before such permission could be received, however, the Pontiff called upon the people of Kessel to join with him in a crusade to bring the way of the Emperor's flesh to all of the peoples of the Imperium. Their righteous armies would overthrow the High Lords of Terror and lead the Imperium back into the light, all under the beneficent rule of the Supreme Pontiff, of course. Kleist acted immediately. Fortunately for him, Kessel had only one major city, the unimaginatively named Port Kessel. The bulk of the population lived in scattered farming communities, spread all over the planet, and Kleist knew that if he acted quickly, he could quell this rebellion before it had a chance to get started. Less than an hour after the pontiff's announcement, Chimera armoured vehicles moved out from the 16th Steel Legion's containment, just outside Port Kessel. The column, under Kleist's personal command, approached Port Kessel's main gate, where it was immediately obvious that the pontiff's followers were not at all prepared for an armoured assault. The gate was lightly held by members of the pontiff's personal guard, whose las guns and heavy stubbers were of little use against the armour plate of the Steel Legion's chimeras. Ignoring the desultory fire from the defenders, Kleist ordered a chimera to smash down the city gate, and then he and the rest of the column surged into the town. Leaving one platoon to secure the gate, Kleist split the remainder of his force into two columns. The smaller of these, consisting of the third company, roared off towards Port Kessel's spaceport and main communication centre. By now, a word had spread that the city was under attack and the third company met more determined opposition than they had at Kessel's main gate. Nonetheless, their defenders still had little in the way of heavy weapons with which to oppose the Steel Legion's chimeras, and after a short but brutal firefight, the communication centre was captured. Meanwhile, Kleist and the rest of his flying column headed towards the divine palace of the Supreme Pontiff. The palace was defended by the bulk of the Pontiff's bodyguard, along with the bodyguard's only armoured vehicle, an ageing Lehman Russ, gifted to Kessel many centuries earlier. The Lehman Russ's crew were desperately attempting to make the tank's aged engine start up when Kleist arrived at the palace. Leading from the front, Kleist's chimera charged at the Lehman Russ, 
shots from its multi-laser bouncing harmlessly off the tank's thick frontal armour. However, the fire distracted the tank's crew, giving Kleist long enough to get behind the armoured behemoth. As the Chimera braked to a halt, the Laz Cannon team, carried in the passenger compartment, threw open the top hatch and let fly at the Lehman Russ's thinner rear armour. The Laz Cannon shot carved through the rear of the tank, hitting its ammunition. With a huge explosion, the Lehman Russ was gone. Thrown into confusion by the destruction of the tank, the remainder of the Pontiff's guard offered little resistance to the troops in Kleist's flying column. In less than two hours, the Pontiff's palace was firmly in the hands of the 16th Steel Legion, and the Pontiff himself had been captured as he attempted to escape in a small skiff from the palace's wharf. The news was broadcast from the captured communication centre, and less than six hours after it had started, the Kessel Rebellion was over. The Kishan Zeno Riders Imperial Guard armies often contain squadrons or even regiments of rough riders. The most famous of these are, of course, the Attilian regiments, fierce nomads born in the saddle who have served the Imperium since its earliest days. The majesty, speed and ruthlessness of these warriors has led to many other regiments of horsemen being incorporated into Imperial armies. Ultimately, though, their weakness lies in the vulnerability of their mounts. There is a strong affection amongst mankind for horses, based on their long association, that encourages their weaknesses to be overlooked. In the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, however, the demands of constant war have led some to consider whether there are Xenos species that could do the job better. One of several species that have been experimented with is the hunting lizard of Kishan. Kishan is a young world, mountainous and volcanic with thick, fast-growing jungles and oceans of primordial swamp. The hunting lizards were one of the most successful local predators. Functioning in packs, they posed a real threat to the early human colonists until they were successfully domesticated and bred in captivity. Over time, the hunting lizards became a much-valued means of patrolling the wild expanses of Kishan, and when the world was populous enough to be tithed, it was inevitable that the regiments raised there would be cavalry mounted on hunting lizards. The Battle of Talavar During the Imperial Crusade to cleanse the Farsin system, 592-602-M41, from the Hrud, an entire regiment of Kishan Zeno riders served with the Imperial Guard's 16th Army. Uh, Fasin had three worlds in its biosphere, each of which was urbanised but in a state of ruined decay. One of the worlds, Talavar, was home to an enslaved human population and was the first targeted. Attempts to clear the ruins with infantry regiments were wholly unsuccessful. The Hrud Emerging from their warrens, conducted highly effective hit-and-run attacks, uh, focused on destroying ammunition and fuel stockpiles. The preternatural speed of the Hrud defeated all attempts at pursuit until the Kishan were deployed. Using feral hunting techniques, the bulk of the regiment closely pursued the Hrud, while detached squadrons raced forward on the flanks to herd them together and finally encircle them. The raids were swiftly contained, allowing the 16th Army's infantry to concentrate on launching set-piece assaults on the Hrud's warrens themselves and liberating the world. The 13th Penal Legion, under the command of Colonel Schaefer. The Imperial Guard is a vast organisation containing armies of soldiers in their hundreds of thousands and even many millions. Discipline and faith are paramount, when quite often it is the heretic and the traitor who pose the greatest threat to the future of mankind. Thus, an infraction against the military law of the Imperial Guard is usually dealt with swiftly and harshly. Battlefield executions by commissars, banishment to prison worlds, alteration into mindless servitors or frenzied arco-flagellants are all possible fates for those who kill their fellow soldiers, loot a conquered world, or betray their officers and their emperor. Then there are those whose skills are too useful to waste. Veteran officers who countermand orders. Snipers who refuse to kill. 
Soldiers who have seen enough death to drive them insane. These are the warriors who are spared the gallows, for they are more useful to the Emperor alive, if only for a short time, than dead or imprisoned. These men and women, brutal killers, rogues, cowards and thieves, make up the ranks of the penal legions. Most penal legions are not dissimilar to any other Imperial Guard regiment. The 13th Penal Legion is, however, different. Those miscreants who fall under the eye of Colonel Schaefer are given a simple choice. Fight for the Colonel or die. Quite often there is no distinction at all, as Colonel Schaefer's missions are almost invariably suicidal for those involved. However, the promised reward is lure enough to a desperate man or woman awaiting the hangman's visit. Survive the mission and receive a pardon for your crimes. Schaefer does not just give his soldiers the chance to escape their punishment, he offers them an opportunity to purify the sin from their souls before they die. A soldier who dies in the service of the Emperor has earned the right to dwell beside the immortal Lord, but one who dies a traitor to mankind is damned to the eternal abyss of chaos. It is for this reason that the soldiers of the 13th Legion commonly refer to themselves as the Last Chancers. Nobody is sure how long Colonel Schaefer has led the Last Chancers, or how many times he has cheated death himself. His missions take him to the far corners of the galaxy, and so, though he appears to be a man of perhaps no more than 40 Terran years, the time distortion effect of so much warp travel means that he has been in Imperial service for centuries. Over that time, Schaefer has participated in some of the bloodiest fighting mankind has ever witnessed. Forlorn hope assaults against enemy fortresses, city fighting across blood-stained ruins on death worlds, below ice worlds, and in the scorching heat of desert worlds. Schaefer has seen them all and survived. The last chances vary in number, but they are always picked for a specific objective. When he has time, Schaefer may lead hundreds, even thousands of men on a campaign, dragging them through the most dangerous war zones imaginable until only the hardest, most desperate and savage fighters remain. Only then do they embark on their real mission. Alternatively, if time is short, then Schaefer will hand-pick his team from the outset and train them for their purpose. He maintains contact with other penal legion commanders, the governors of prison worlds, and also is known to communicate with members of the Inquisition. For these sources, he gathers the flawed elite of the Imperial Guard, and they are brought together at various holding prisons that have been established across the Imperium. From these men and women, the most vicious, undisciplined dregs of the Imperium, he chooses the last chances. Though few survive one of Schaefer's missions, the Colonel himself has always come through, often totally unscathed. Some believe he is guided by the Emperor, others that he is not even human, but the result of secret Adeptus Mechanicus tampering. Possibly only a select few members of the Inquisition know the truth. However it came about, Schaefer is one of the most gifted leaders alive. He is able to push his troopers to their limits, and then beyond, using his innate knowledge of how their minds work, through a mixture of punishment and hope. Schaefer's past record is exemplary, and he has never failed in a mission yet, despite horrendous casualties suffered by his men. In fact, it is common for no last chances to survive. Somehow he always achieves his aim. Whole wars have been won or shortened by his efforts. Alien conquests halted in their infancy by a well-timed strike, and traitor generals and imperial commanders hunted down before their evil has spread. Often unseen, the last chances fight behind enemy lines to attack supply dumps and command headquarters, ambush enemy columns or sabotage their food and water. Though he has probably earned the right to the title of War Master by his efforts, a stretch, I have to say, Schaefer prefers this covert warfare and in the spiritual cleansing of those he commands. An oddity amongst many last chances, uh, Lieutenant Cage is the only soldier to have ever survived a mission with Colonel Schaefer and yet still remain in the 13th Penal Legion. Originally sent to a gulag world for the murder of his sergeant over a woman, Cage attempted to steal the shuttle that was visiting the prison planet. It was his misfortune 
or perhaps divine intervention, by the Emperor, that the shuttle belonged to Colonel Schaefer. Impressed by Cage's initiative and sheer murderous intent, Schaefer immediately drafted him into the last chances. Despite numerous escape attempts, Cage never managed to get away from Schaefer, though he survived the destruction of the fortress world of Coritanorum. On a mission led by the Colonel, Cage had become so unhinged by the knowledge that he was the only other survivor that he fell into battle psychosis. This came to a head when he was gripped by a frenzy and attacked his fellow officers in his new regiment, killing one in his drunken rage. The next day, his pardon had been torn up and Schaefer was waiting for him. Cage has never worked out how the colonel knew he would transgress again and has long since stopped worrying about it. His psychosis has been deepened further by the many unpleasant acts he has since performed in the service of Colonel Schaefer, to the point he has uncontrollable visions and waking nightmares. Cage is caught between his hatred of Schaefer for destroying his life and the knowledge that without war, he no longer has any purpose. A born survivor, Cage is adamant that he will outlive the Colonel, and only then will he know some measure of peace. Or, more likely, and get himself into trouble and be killed. Cage's future and Schaefer's are entwined, as it no longer matters how many times he follows the colonel into battle, as Schaefer once told him, you only get one last chance. Though the colonel's current duties have led him to the far side of the galaxy, even Schaefer was once embroiled in the cataclysm that has engulfed the galaxy from the Eye of Terror. Many years ago, when Abaddon's 13th Crusade was not even a rumour, Schaefer and his hand-picked team were sent into the Eye of Terror. Only a few Inquisitors know of the mission that took place, and fewer still of its true purpose. Colonel Schaefer's goal was straightforward, if not easy. Uh, destroy a small outpost of the Black Legion traitor Space Marines. Assembling his squad, Schaefer was transported by a specially shielded starship, through the Ark's gap into the Eye of Terror itself. Three navigators died locating the demon world of Gorthesta, but eventually the last chances were deposited on the planet, out of range of any detection augers the enemy may have possessed. There was no day or night on Gorthesta, only an endless sky of purple haze that roiled with violent storms. The last chances had to fight their way across this inhospitable realm, battling nightmarish demonic entities and the planet itself. The six survivors of the twelve-man team that had landed breached the perimeter of the outpost under the cover of a massive tempest, so destructive that the ground trembled beneath their feet. Schaefer led his men on a cleanse of the guard buildings that surrounded the traitor complex, dispatching the few traitor marines they encountered with brutal efficiency. However, as they cleared the last guardhouse, the alarm was finally raised. Dashing across the open ground with the storm lashing down with acidic rain, the last chances rushed the central compound in the teeth of the enemy's bolter fire, losing two more of their number. They were about to enter the cathedral-sized central edifice when a pair of massive gates began to grind open. Through the gate came a monstrous biomechanical beast, a fusion of flesh and metal that strode towards them on six piston-driven legs. The roars of the demon engine could be heard even above the deafening thunder, its weapons bathing the last chances in shells and flames as it stormed towards them. Behind the defiler, six traitor marines advanced, their bolters booming. The colonel himself was bathed in demonic fire, but leapt clear, his clothes ablaze, and hurled a cluster of melter bombs at the machine. The detonations tore the demon engine apart from below, releasing the trapped demon within. Before its essence dissipated, the demon ripped apart two more of Schaefer's men and tore through the squad of Black Legion marines that had accompanied it. Seizing the opportunity that had presented itself, Schaefer led the two remaining last chances on a charge through the open gates. Within the huge, vaulted chamber beyond, they found the dormant shells of five more of the demon engines. At its centre, the Black Legionaries had erected an obscene altar to the gods of chaos, 
pulsing with unearthly energies, filling the minds of the last chancers with demonic laughter. Schaefer pressed on, placing melter bombs on the Promethean barrels intended to fuel the Defiler's arcane engines. The two remaining members of the squad were reduced to gibbering wrecks by this surging chaos energy. One of them, a ghostly light in his eyes, hurled himself at Schaefer with murderous intent. Schaefer shot him between his eyes with his bolt pistol before dragging the other unfortunate clear. As they escaped the compound, the melter bombs detonated, turning the outpost into a ball of fire and plasma that towered into the sky. Hideously burned, carrying the limp form of his companion, Schaefer made the trek of many kilometres back to his ship. None can say what might have happened had the Black Legion finished their construction of the Defilers. Had the Defilers been set loose, it is entirely possible they would have opened up a staging point for Abaddon to launch his crusade through the Ark's Gap, rather than against the formidable defences of the Cadian Gate. For Schaefer, there was no time to rest, but even as he recuperated from his injuries, word came of the renewed Tyranid threat growing on the eastern fringe. The Necromundan Ape, known as the Spiders. The Ape are drawn from the Spider Clan of the Palatine Hive Complex on the Hive World of Necromunda, and are famed throughout the Necromundan subsector for the ferocity bred into them from an early age amidst the lawless levels of the Underhive. The Spider Clan is the dominant gang of the lower levels of the Palatine Hive, and for many centuries has been supplied with weapons and equipment by the Hive Governor in return for keeping the criminal activities of other gangs under control. The Spiders are, on paper at least, considered a standing unit in the Necromundum Planetary Defence Force, and have been tithed to fight off-world on many occasions throughout their long history. When the Spiders are recruited into the Guard, they are organised into platoons that comprise an entire gang. The officers are prominent individuals in the Spider Clan, and command enormous respect and sometimes fear from the gangers under their command. This organisation has proved highly effective as the troopers bring with them a level of expertise in close combat and weaponry seldom seen in a guard regiment until months of specialised training have been completed. The Battle of Deucalion The most famous battle honour earned by the ape was for its actions at the Battle of Deucalion. The first army of Warmaster Solon had been driven back at the planet Deucalion, and he had reluctantly ordered his forces evacuated. The entire army, consisting of at least 30 regiments organised into three massive divisions, had gathered at the landing site, where super-heavy troop transports were landing by the score to ferry them to the fleet, waiting in orbit. As the troops filed aboard their ships, the enemy broke through the Warmaster's perimeter and quickly brought up their mobile artillery and assault guns into range of the landing field. As the final flight of troop ships touched down, shells began to fall in their midst. The densely packed guardsmen could not escape the bombardment, and hundreds died in the opening salvo. Then the first of the troop transports was struck a glancing blow by an air-bursting shell and listed to one side as its pilots fought to keep it airborne. But the damage was too great and the hundred-metre-high vessel ploughed into the ground, crushing an entire regiment beneath it before exploding, taking many hundreds more with it. The scene at the drop site was one of utter chaos, as officers and commissars sought to keep order amongst their men. In a matter of minutes, almost half the landing ships were destroyed, and the death toll was catastrophic. By far the highest the warmaster's forces had suffered. Something had to be done and Colonel Raven Mortz of the 8th was to earn the regiment its place in history with his actions. Seeing that the war master and his own troops had yet to evacuate, Colonel Mortz ordered the 8th to advance on the enemy. Relinquishing any hope of evacuation, the spiders charged through the acrid smoke and churning dust thrown up by the bombardment, never to be seen again. Within minutes, the force of the bombardment lessened allowing the last of the super-heavy transports to land in relative safety. The last transport to leave was that of Warmaster Solon himself, who, despite the strenuous protests of his staff officers, risked all to give the ape one last opportunity to escape. 
But as the shells fell closer and closer, the war master had no choice but to order his transports to lift off, abandoning the spiders with a heavy heart. The mordant 303rd Acid Dogs. Mordant Prime is a world situated to the northwest of the Eye of Terror and is known for the mining of bioluminescent bacteria from which a unique, highly corrosive acid is extracted. Mordant is classed by the Adeptus Terra as a night world, and its surface is a barren wasteland, totally unfit for human habitation. The only reason humanity exists at all on the world is to mine the strains of luminescent bacteria that grow beneath the surface. Uh, these strains uh, live off the phosphorite content in the rock, secreting a corrosive acid that breaks down the rock into a digestible form. Over the millennia, this process has formed a vast chain of caverns and tunnels that connect across the entire world. Within these tunnels, mining clans extract the bacteria, culturing it in vast cavern vats to bleed off the most corrosive acids known to the Imperium. These extracts are shipped to forge worlds across the sector, where they find use in all manner of esoteric industrial processes. The peoples of Mordant can be split into two broad categories, the acid miners and everyone else. The miners are organised into an ancient clan structure and have total control over their business. They exploit cheap local labour, paying the workers barely enough to survive in the run-down shanty caverns they call home. Many of the disenfranchised citizens of Mordant turn to a life of organised crime, and gang violence is the only authority acknowledged amongst many of the deeper settlements. The Imperial Guard regiments drawn from Mordant are raised from amongst these citizens, disaffected with life on their world. They cannot live on the pittance paid by the mining clans, and they will not sink so low as to leech off their own people as the gangs do. The 303rd Regiment is just such a unit, and as with any other mordant force, is generally fielded in war zones where the troopers' native affinity with darkness and confined spaces can be best utilised. Mordant regiments are often fielded on night worlds and are known to make excellent tunnel fighters when the need arises. The Delphic Infestation The 303rd Regiment was originally a planetary defence force until tasked with keeping the peace in and around deep core mining settlements of Delphic Sink. The local gangs and the heavies employed by the mining clans had for many years engaged in a violent struggle against one another for control of the many hundreds of subsidiary tunnels in the area. The gangs for smuggling and the clans for access to the rich acid seams. When a work party failed to report back at the end of their shift, no one paid any heed, assuming that the miners had fallen prey to an outlaw gang using the tunnels to circumvent the Arbites and militia patrols. But over the course of several months, more and more men went missing, and soon the problem could be ignored no longer. The troopers of the local PDF garrison were sent to investigate. In command of the garrison was uh, Captain Saul, who set off at the head of a company of his militiamen into the deepest ways beneath Delphic Sink, determined to discover the cause of the mysterious disappearances. After action reports logged by Saul tell of a deep reconnaissance of the tunnels, a glow with bioluminescent bacteria through which humans had never passed, vast caverns were discovered, the vaults of which formed a pulsing fluorescent sky many hundreds of metres overhead. Four days into the mission, Saul's company was ambushed in an area devoid of even the dim glow of the acid bacteria. The attackers were small and highly dexterous, adept at fighting in the low light conditions of the tunnels. They employed a bizarre form of weaponry, a long rifle that projected an actinic gobbit of highly volatile energy. Saul lost almost a third of his company in the ambush, but rallied his men, who discovered that the attackers lacked the stomach for close-in fighting, and disappeared into the dark tunnels as soon as they were engaged. The captain sent forward his most able men to scout the depths of the catacombs up ahead, and within hours reports of more fighting came flooding back. Saul sent his entire force forward to relieve his scouts, and found them engaged in a desperate battle in a complex 
honeycomb cave system. The tunnels were infested with the same creatures that had ambushed them earlier, but this time they fought with the savagery of cornered beasts rather than sly ambushers. Ordering his flamer teams forward, Saul and his men scoured the cave system of the twisted creatures, immolating hundreds as they poured down the tunnels towards his squads. The battle took a horrific toll on the militiamen, but against terrible odds they succeeded. Not one of the foul aliens escaped, though only one quarter of the company emerged from the catacombs to return to Delphic Sink. Saul ordered patrols sent into all the cave systems surrounding the settlement, and several more of the alien infestations were discovered and cleansed. Three years later, Abaddon unleashed his 13th Black Crusade against the Imperium, and Saul's militia were tithed into the mordant Imperial Guard regiments as the 303rd. The regiment maintains a cadre of specialised tunnel fighters, the original survivors of that first action against the aliens infesting the tunnels of their homeworld. And these hard-bitten men and women have gained a fearsome reputation with the enemies of the Imperium. Drukean Fengard Hailing from the storm-racked world of Drukia VI, in the northern extremes of Segmentum Obscurus, the Fengard are a predominantly light infantry regiment, but their record-mounted cavalry squadrons are well known for their infiltration and scouting skills. The regiment's homeworld is covered almost entirely with mist-shrouded bogs and swamps, and only a handful of cities provide an imperial presence. This means that the population occupying the wilds are left almost entirely to their own devices, except when, once a generation, they are called upon to provide men for the Imperial Guard. The people of Drukia live for the honour of their family name, viewing any outsider as an enemy, barely worthy in their eyes of drawing breath. The families wage a constant war upon one another, raiding into the ancestral lands of their neighbouring folk, committing murder and pillaging whatever they can make off with upon the backs of their shaggy recorn riding beasts. The bulk of a Drukian Fengard regiment will consist of standard line infantry, often deployed in areas where their native abilities can be best utilised. The most skilled and often the most violent of the troopers make ideal skirmishers, scouts and infiltrators. Commissars serving with Drukian regiments have found the best method of motivating their unruly charges is to take advantage of their hatred of strangers, to identify the enemy with an opposing clan, and if necessary, infer that some unforgivable insult has been issued regarding the regiment's ancestry. Mounted Drukian units a favour tactic centred on a rapid and stealthy infiltration, followed by a lethal close assault if the odds are in their favour. It has been noted, however, that Drukian cavalry are not famed for steadfast discipline in the face of a superior foe, and will often melt away as stealthily as they arrived, rather than risk a confrontation they believe they cannot win. This has led to a high number of desertions in the past, and a regiment is never deployed without a high proportion of commissars in attendance. The Battle of Traitor's Moss By the end of 448M41, the 17th year of Warmaster Kamenov's crusade against the separatist Canis hegemony, Imperial forces found themselves overstretched and cut off from effective logistical support. The Imperial Navy had become embroiled in a policing action against the reavers and smugglers of the Opaline Vale, and the ground forces of the Imperial Guard found themselves unsupported and incapable of timely redeployment. The Warmaster needed to unlock the stalemate, and when the opportunity came, it was from a completely unanticipated quarter. The Drukian 72nd, commanded by Colonel Wharton, was scouting the world of Alien 7 in preparation for a push into the alien system. The Navy's inability to prosecute the pirates of the Opaline Vale had stalled the push, leaving the 72nd cut off from the main body of the Crusade, forcing the troopers to rely on their survival skills to live off the terrain. It was at this point that the enemy, the 12th Army of the Canis Hegemony, moved on Alien 7. 
The first sign that a planetfall was imminent came when a patrol of Drukian light cavalry encountered a unit of enemy pathfinders scouting the lowlands of Alien Central Velt. Colonel Wharton ordered his patrols increased, but instructed his men to observe the enemy from a distance rather than engage them directly. He needed to find out what they were planning and did not want to reveal the presence of his own small force until he had the measure of his foe. Wharton realised that if he could draw the enemy onto Alien, notably into the boggy areas bordering the low grasslands of the Velt, he could use the superior abilities of his force to hold the enemy until the Crusade could arrive to finish them off. He also knew that his men were unlikely to prove effective unless they had the advantage of determining the time and place of the battle. Wharton ordered an enemy patrol captured, and after a necessarily brutal interrogation, used captured authentication codes to ensure the enemy landing occurred at an area of his choosing. The area Wharton chose was a vast belt of swamps and bogs that became known as Traitor's Moss, and the army of the Canis Hegenemy fell for this trap. As the Vanguard took position amidst the swamps, the enemy began their landing, Huge troop transports homed in on the signal beacons he had captured from their pathfinders, each ferrying hundreds of men and tanks. As the first touched down, it immediately became apparent that the ground would not support the gargantuan dropship's weight, and as it began to list, then sink into the soft ground, the remaining ships attempted to alter their course. But the approach vectors were set. The vast bulk and momentum of the troop ships made it impossible for them to pull up in time. In minutes, the drop ships were mired, their passengers desperately trying to escape. As the enemy troops attempted to get clear of their doomed ships, the 72nd attacked. Ghost like figures emerged from the bogs, cutting down the disorganized enemy in swaves. Mounted Fengar charged through the mists thrown up as the drop ships' retro thrusters vaporized the swamps, ruthlessly felling the separatists with their hunting lances. In less than an hour, those enemy troops not butchered by the Drukians were fleeing through the swamps, routed by the merciless attack. In less than a week, the refugees had all been rounded up, those not slain as they fled, taken prisoner to be presented to War Master Kamenov, when the crusade arrived three months later. The action went down in the annals of the Canis Crusade, gaining, as it did, a foothold into the inner systems of the Hegenemy, and ultimately leading to the Imperium's victory seven years later. The 72nd had achieved a kill ratio unmatched by any Drukian regiment before or after. At the Battle of Traitor's Moss, less than 900 Fengard routed a force of over 20,000 separatists, earning Colonel Wharton the command of an entire battle group, in honour of his victory there. The Finrite Highlanders The peoples of the mountainous, feral world of Finrite Free Seven are proud and noble, and their taciturn nature is a reflection of the rugged highlands they call home. The Highlanders are a nomadic people who follow the migrating herds of mountain-dwelling rocks introduced to the world many ages before making their homes wherever the thousands strong migrations settle and moving on as the seasons change. Each tribe has a hereditary claim to a particular herd, though they have no control over its movements. This means that the tribes of Finrite Free Seven place no value on claims to ownership of land, as the herd will go where it will, paying no heed to lines drawn on a map. Each tribe makes a living off its herd, taking only the weakest grocks as food and trading the cured hides with other tribes when they have a surplus. A tradition dating back to pre-imperial times states that once every five seasons the tribes are required to make a tribute to the imperial overlords that reside in the world's only permanent population centres, vast walled spaceports situated in the valleys. When the tribute time comes, the tribe's most skilled herdsmen must separate a portion of the herd and drive it towards the distant valleys, a difficult task considering the nature of the beasts they must steer. At the tribute, the overlords take possession of their share of the herds, 
where they are slaughtered, packed and shipped off across the entire Agrippina sector to provide food for overpopulated worlds. On occasion, the tribe will be unable or unwilling to provide the tribute demanded of it, and the overlords will take it in a different form, the service of the tribe's young men and women in the Finrite Imperial Guard regiments. An officer cadre, drawn from the Imperial ruling classes who reside within Finrite's walled spaceports, leads the Highlander regiments. The tribes of Finrite are primitive in comparison to most Imperial citizens and receive only basic training in the use of the standard pattern lasgun and man-portable support weapons of the Guard. The officers have access to more advanced weaponry and equipment, and vehicle crews and support personnel are also recruited from amongst the more civilised populations of the Imperial ports. The Pacification of Sigma Agrius The teeming worlds of the Agrippina sector are fed by the scores of agri-worlds scattered throughout the region, and Sigma Agrius was for many centuries amongst the most productive and fertile sources of foodstuffs available. But the world's long-standing reputation was laid low and the population, made up almost entirely of rattlings, diminutive abhumans, scorned as mutants on many worlds, rightly, and declared the planet independent of the rule of the Adeptus Terror. The Departmento Munitorum calculated that a single Imperial Guard regiment would be sufficient to pacify the agri-world, Considering the poorly equipped and notoriously undisciplined rattlings, no serious threat to a well-led guard unit. The leaders of the rebellion realised this too, and the rebels went to ground as soon as the 122nd's troop ships touched down. Colonel Sarret, the commander-in-chief of the invasion, ordered his Van Wood companies to form a perimeter around the landing sites to ensure the super-heavy transports carrying the regiment's Heavy equipment could touch down safely. The advance companies spread out through the verdant pastures, but were struck by the total lack of any enemy contact. Soon, they were marching down the streets of eerily quiet, deserted pastoral villages, uneasy with the lack of an enemy to get to grips with. It was a week before the first contact was made with the enemy, as a Highlander patrol came under fire as it crossed a bridge over the River Carleen. Forced to fall back, the commanding officer awaited reinforcements to pursue the ambushers into the countryside. This was the first action of a war that saw the rebels engage in a hit-and-run guerrilla-style defence of their world. The Highlanders were forced onto the defensive for many long months before the senior regimental commissar ordered a change in tactics that horrified Colonel Sarat and his men. The Highlanders were ordered to raise every farm and village they came across in an effort to deny the rebels their supply routes and draw them out into a battle they had no chance of winning. The colonel accepted the necessity of the change in strategy and put the commissar's orders into action. The end came only after a sustained campaign of brutal suppression, one that saw the rebels pushed back into an area that became known as the Atrinine Pocket. Within the pocket, an area of gently rolling hills, some 90 kilometres square, the rebel army was completely surrounded, bombarded day and night, and eventually destroyed utterly. The Highlanders, who had suffered severe casualties in the first phase of the pacification, sustained minimal losses once they had brought the enemy to battle. They were awarded the stewardship of Sigma Agrius, and eventually settled it, forming a new ruling gentry over the abhuman workers. Once again, the world is a highly prolific centre of food production, though the descendants of the Highlanders still keep an ever-watchful eye over the abhuban population of Sigma Agrius. Duran Dragoons The Duran regiments are primarily mechanised infantry, with the bulk of their soldiery being carried into battle in Chimera armoured fighting vehicles. The Duran regiments maintain large armoured formations and, in keeping with this, have close ties with many armoured companies of the Imperial Guard, such as the Narminians and the Ketzok 17th. These long associations have seen the Durans a part of the four elements of many campaigns, exploiting the gaps smashed in enemy lines by the heavy attacks of the armoured companies and holding the ground gained against all odds. The officers of the regiment are primarily those born to one of the many noble houses of Jura, and unlike many of the 
ruling aristocracies of other worlds, those of Jura are, in the main, well respected and honourable. Those born to nobility have to earn the respect of their fellow soldiers by serving in the PDF regiments, and those selected to join the Guard are of proven courage and ability. As such, the Guardsmen of the Durands trust their officers not to lead them into harm's way without good reason, and have followed them through many horrific battles where other regiments, with perhaps a lesser uh, faith in their commanders, might have faltered. Exemplifying the Duran regimental motto, The brave may fall, but will never yield. The Duran system has three habitable planets, and it is from these worlds that the regiments of the Duran dragoons are raised. The Duran Free is a hot industrial world, where the bulk of the regiment's strength is drawn, and where many of the locally produced munitions and vehicles are forged. Duran 5 is an agri-world, with a small but hardy population, and where a great many of the ruling families of the system own extensive estates and hunt the native carnosaurs. The system capital, Jura, is a verdant and wealthy world, ruled over by a hereditary aristocracy whose high-born sons and daughters form the majority of the officer class of the regiment. It is seen as part of every family's duty to send at least one of their scions to serve in the world's planetary defence force, where they will spend at least five years training and fighting in and around the system. The very best will be mustered to join the regiments, and it is a source of great pride to have a son or daughter uh, chosen to join the Duran regiments. Each noble house maintains its own records of its ancestors' heroic deeds, and the sprawling hall of heroes on Jura also contains every record of service, listing the actions of each regiment raised on Jura, with each officer, guardsman and tank crew who has earned a commendation, whether posthumously or still serving, listed on that regiment's roll of honour. An army of scribes, quell servitors and notaries spend their entire existence cataloguing their world's regiment's exploits across the galaxy, though given the time dilation inherent in communication and travel over such vast distances, there is a never-ending task of cross-referencing, backtracking and updating, and every regimental adjutant is meticulous in their sending back of detailed after-action reports. Currently, the veracitors of the Hall of Heroes are attempting to confirm the fate of the 383rd Regiment, from whom they have received nothing in the way of records or after-action reports for nearly a decade now. Last listed as being seconded to the Adeptus Mechanicus for an indefinite time, the requests for their current status have been ignored by the priests of the Machine God, who repeatedly deny that any such regiment has ever been attached to their order. However, in the most recent days, a lone soldier has been returned to Jura by the Imperial Fist's chapter of Space Marines, and has repeatedly claimed that the regiment was annihilated by a force of Chaos Space Marines on a distant desert world. But this man is a known low character, with a history of repeated drunkenness and disciplinary infractions, and his claims are not taken seriously. The Elegan Salient During the final stages of the Erwint campaign, the 327th Duran Dragoons took part in a massive combined attack on the fortifications and trench lines surrounding the last pockets of resistance around the rebel-held capital. The Durans were part of a force given the task of attacking an area of the line known as the Elegan Salient. Intelligence had claimed that repeated bombing sorties launched by marauders of the Imperial Navy had disrupted supply columns to such an extent that the forces defending the salient had ammunition for perhaps a few volleys at most. Normally, armoured companies would undertake such an action, but the decision was taken to send in the Jurans, given that resistance was expected to be minimal. The attack commenced at dawn after a lengthy bombardment from a dozen artillery platoons attached to the 327th. The Chimeras, carrying the Juran guardsmen, sped across the cratered ground at speed towards the enemy lines, but as the gap closed, a concentrated fusillade of anti-armour fire decimated the lead vehicles. As volley after volley hammered the Jurans, it became clear that the rebels were as well supplied as any other part of the line. As casualties continued to mount, a blazing Juran chimera crashed down into a portion of the enemy trenches 
and collided with an ammo gurney transporting heavy ordnance, levelling a huge portion of the trench and blowing a gap in the defences. Seizing their chance, the Durans drove with all speed towards the gap and, anchoring themselves at the breach, debarked in their hundreds to flank the defenders on either side. For a bloody three hours, fierce hand-to-hand fighting raged through the labyrinthine trench network until the Duran battle flag was raised over their shattered remains. Rebel forces counterattacked three times during the course of the day in an attempt to dislodge the Durans from their position, but were repulsed each time. And as dusk drew in, Narminian armoured companies arrived to relieve the Durans. The follow-on forces arriving to consolidate the breach allowed the Durans to pull back and assess their losses, which amounted to nearly two-thirds of their strength. In the aftermath of the campaign, every man and woman who had taken part in the battle was awarded the Medallion Crimson, and the regiment's colonel was awarded the Macarian Cross. The Savlar Chemdogs The Savlar system, just over a hundred light years from Armageddon, is a desolate place, little valued by the Imperium, save for the rich chemical deposits on the volcanic moons of Savlar Penitens. Unsatisfied by poor mining quota returns, the Adeptus Terra regraded Savlar as a penal world in the 39th millennium, shipping in criminals by the thousand from the recent Bokar Rebellion, along with special detachments of the Adeptus Arbites to ensure productivity. Within three decades, chemical production from Savlar was supplying three civilised worlds and two forge worlds in the surrounding subsectors. The population of the moons was subsequently swelled by regular influxes of thieves, murderers and traitors from across the Armageddon sector. The high mortality rate in the poisonous mines of Savlar became notorious among the criminal fraternity, leading to it being known as the Dead Dog Moons, and phrases like Dead as Savlar. The Bokerite Uprising Two centuries of successive pirate raids devastated almost all production facilities on Savlar in the early 40th millennium. Despite their best efforts, the Adeptus Arbites were simply not numerous enough to protect all of what had by now become a valuable commodity. Leave was sought and eventually granted to raise defence militia regiments from the populace of Savlar. Better access to filter masks and Medication was a benefit of membership in the militia, so volunteers were plentiful, and Judge Callistar of the Arbites used a careful selection process and arming policy to ensure no insurrection could take place, or so he thought. The descendants of Bukhar had never truly abandoned their ancestors' anarcho-capitalist beliefs, and they moved carefully to infiltrate the defence militias. After decades of preparation, the Bokarites staged a major uprising across all of the dead dog moons, seizing several armories and precinct forts. Soon a column of chimera carriers and mining trucks full of troops were pushing along the main highway through the impassable nitrous marshes which surround Lutsk, the precinct capital. While his arbitrators fought to contain the Bokarite rebellion, Judge Callistar sought some kind of solution to crushing it. The Bokarites controlled, at best, 25-30% to 30% of the total militia regiments on Savlar, although they were better motivated and trained than most. The problem was that the remaining regiments would likely leave the Bokarites and Arbites to fight each other, so they could loot the battlefield afterwards. Eventually, he concocted a plan. The Bokarite thrust was a scant 12 kilometres from the precinct capital when it ran into heavy opposition from Arbites using dismounted orbital cannons dug into hills on the route. Heavy fighting continued until dusk, with individual chimeras having to draw back to the truck column to replenish their ammunition. As the light faded, chem-crazed militiamen emerged from the supposedly impassable nitrous swamps on either side of the highway. The ragged figures were soon cackling insanely and shooting wildly, while militia vehicles and chem riders appeared on the roadway itself. The Bokarite column was densely packed and found itself in serious trouble. Vehicles and men struggled to turn about and deploy, taking constant casualties as trucks blew up from las fire and grenades. Finally, the order was given to disengage and the Bokarites tried to fight their way clear, but they were hemmed in on all sides. 
Individual pockets of resistance flared where a squad or chimera stood off the swarming convicts for a time, but all too quickly the Bokerites were dragged down by their less ideological fellow inmates. By dawn, the highway had been picked clean, save for the skeletal wrecks of burnt-out vehicles. In light of the ability of Savlar to control its own affairs, the right to raise defence regiments stayed in place, despite the Bokar incident. By the mid-thirtieth millennium, orc incursions into the Armageddon sector had reached such severity that the first Savlar-recruited Imperial Guard regiments of so-called chemdogs were sent off-world to fight. Records show that Judge Callistar always delighted in telling the story of how the Savlar chemdogs first came into being. According to tradition, he also cited two motivational imperatives. To every procurator colonel, forming up a new regiment. 1. Tell them they can keep anything they take off the enemy. 2. Tell them that if they break the law, they'll be sent back to the dead dog moons. The Death Corps of Krieg Editor's Note Again, I would direct you to a previous Vox cast covering the origins of the Death Corps during their planet's apocalyptic civil war. And I would inform you of a lengthy Vox cast coming in the not-too-distant future detailing the notorious siege of Vrak's campaign. Today, however, we shall be covering a smaller but no less glorious engagement. The Eyes of the Emperor In 213M41, the forge world of Kasterberg in the Bathamore system fell to a surprise attack from a vast force of orcs led by warlord Skarmork. The cost of recapturing the planet was sure to be formidable, and the Death Corps regiments were amongst the first to volunteer to take part in the counterattack. In the period prior to the Imperial invasion, the orcs constructed a system of bunkers and citadels centred upon two forge refineries, known as Tahar Prime and Megan. Tahar Prime was taken swiftly in a flanking manoeuvre by the Krieg Death Riders on their bionically enhanced mounts, but Megan would prove to be much tougher to crack open. Without a detailed intelligence on the Orc defences, casualties were expected to be extreme and progress slow. Early in the war, Orc Storm Boys had seized Mount Herneck, the sensor outpost, from the small contingent of Imperial defenders. Known on Casterberg as the Eyes of the Emperor, this array of arcane sensor equipment could provide the Imperial commanders with the information they needed to successfully assault Magan. Uh, due to the vital strategic importance of the outpost, high priority was placed on its capture, and the 95th Death Corps Regiment, the Black Guard, were tasked to retake this heavily defended location. As armoured panzer divisions and infantry forces prepared to cross the Jaxartes River towards Megan, a Death Corps breaching battalion made its way in chimeras to Mount Herneck. The battle plan was to outflank the orcs here also, uh, but the designated approach proved to be heavily mined and inaccessible to the forces' vehicles. Despite this, the guardsmen pressed forward, abandoning damaged and destroyed vehicles along the way. Casualties were high, and many of the Death Corps' commanding officers were killed. Eventually, the Death Corps was forced to abandon the flanking manoeuvre, and Captain Venick, the highest-ranking officer left alive, decided upon a new plan, which required a direct frontal assault. Of course. Upon reaching the base of the mountain, the Death Corps disembarked from its remaining vehicles to approach the eyes of the Emperor on foot. The force was divided into two groups, with each group attacking one of the two peaks on which the outpost was situated. Under cover of darkness, Death Corps members began scaling the steep cliffs of Mount Harnack, and six hours later, after fierce fighting, they captured the lower bunkers. By morning, a firebase had been secured near the Mag Loader Station that ran to the top of the mountain. Ammunition was running low, and so the Death Corps soldiers were forced to use shooters and combi weapons liberated from dead orc defenders to augment their attack. Upon reaching the outer perimeter of the fortifications, the leading platoons flattened the razor wire coils by lying down on the wire allowing the following soldiers to step across them and assault into the fort. The attack swept into the trenches, where fighting was at desperately close quarters, with horrendous casualties on both sides. 
The combat raged for several more hours until fresh troops were ferried to the mountain top by the captured Magloader, and the tide of battle turned in favour of the Death Corps. Flamer and Melter teams moved in to clear the trenches, and soon the Death Corps' regimental flag was raised to the top of the base's listening post antennae. The battle had lasted for twelve bloody hours and had killed six hundred Death Corps members and wounded nearly a thousand others. Captain Vinnick, posthumously promoted to the rank of Colonel, also died in the attack. Even after taking a mortal wound in the early stages of the battle, he had continued to direct his soldiers until finally being carried down the mountain by medics. After recapturing the eyes of the Emperor, Death Corps regiments joined Colonel Milos Ran's panzer divisions in their thrust towards Migan. The campaign was to last another six months, and thanks to the intelligence provided by the sensor outpost, Imperial casualties were significantly lower than projected estimates. Editor's note. Yes, it does say Panzer Divisions. I'm not making it up. Elysian Drop Troopers The Elysians come from a verdant world some 30 light years from Armageddon, towards the Galactic Hub. The Elysia system and surrounding wilderness space is notorious for its pirates, as a main trade route through the sector passes through Elysia, and the system's many swirling gas clouds and hundreds of asteroid fields provide perfect ambush sites. Through combating this ever-present threat, the Elysians are therefore well-trained in ship-to-ship boarding actions and fighting in concert with orbital support when attacking isolated pirate bases. The Scopius Incident The preferred operational style of the Elysian drop troops is amply demonstrated in accounts of the Scopius incident. Scopius was a large asteroid in intersystem space, roughly a week's warp travel from Elysia. It was populated by the Adeptus Mechanicus, who used the otherwise lifeless rock as a facility for dangerous experimentation and analysis of potentially hazardous discoveries. It was therefore natural that when, in 873M38, the explorator vessel Incalculus Stella came across an alien edifice floating in wilderness space not far from Scopius, they would take it to the asteroid facility. Astropaths in surrounding sectors began to report all manner of ill omens in their messages. Dreams and visions were blood-red and filled with screaming faces. A routine patrol by the Imperial Navy reported no contact with Scopius and the 22nd Elysian Regiment was sent to investigate. Colonel Prinz of the 22nd treated the whole of Scopius as potentially hostile, and deployed several recce companies to act as scouting parties alongside Imperial Navy ground observation officers. The recce teams at first reported Scopius deserted, although the machinery seemed to be working at full volume. As the Elysians proceeded, there came sporadic reports of fighting, but Prinz could get no details. Each landing party that signalled engagement with the enemy soon fell silent. Scattered comms chatter identified the enemy as humanoid, extremely fast and powerful. Prince first suspected the Eldar, and he ordered the rest of his regiment onto full drop alert, ready to respond at a moment's notice. The two surviving companies made steady progress across Scopius, uh, working their way towards the main factory complexes at its northern pole. It was Captain Schultz of the 3rd Recce Company who first called in an amazing discovery. The production lines had been completely altered, transformed into something completely unrecognisable to the naval tech priests accompanying the guardsmen. They were producing what at first seemed to be statues of skeletal humans, but on closer inspection the tech priests concluded that the factories were making artificial warriors. It seemed none of them were active yet, but it was only a matter of time before there would be thousands of warriors ready. Prinz ordered the recce companies to locate the control centre, and shut down the whole facility, and they were to call for help the moment they ran into trouble. That trouble lay in wait for them at the control complex. Just as the first reports of renewed combat came up from Scopius's surface, the fleet astropaths warned Colonel Prinz that they had detected something incredibly ancient and utterly evil on the asteroid below. They were half insane with terror at what they had found, and it was impossible to get any clear information from them. The Elysian colonel ordered a full launch onto the control centre. 
the guardsmen had simple orders. Destroy anything they found. As the dropship screamed down through Scopius's thin atmosphere, the sky burned with retro thrusters of the Elysian landers. Prince himself was one of the first into the complex and was horrified to find nothing of the wrecky companies. It was a short while later that he found the alien edifice, sarcophagus-like and exuding a menace that even he could detect. As Prinz and his command company watched, the coffin-shaped monolith began to glow, and as the light became almost blinding, a silhouette appeared inside, the creature that stepped from the gateway. For that is what the object appeared to be, was tall and lithe, almost skeletal. It appeared unarmed, but as Prinz ordered his men to open fire, the alien exploded into life. Leaping into the guardsmen so fast it was merely a blur of darkness. The screams of the dying and the wounded echoed off the metal walls of the command centre as the ancient monstrosity carved its way through squad after squad of men, ripping them apart with its hands, seemingly impervious to their weapons. It was then that the metal warriors from the factory burst into the command centre, blasts of energy from their guns disintegrating anything in their path. The firefight became intense. Alien machines were blown apart by fuselages of heavy bolter fire. Las cannon beams crisscrossed the chamber of the command complex. Plasma bolts burned through walls, while beams of bright energy made men evaporate into nothing. The Elysians were taking heavy casualties, and Prinz ordered the survivors to retreat back to the landers and take off for orbit. As they retreated, the fleet set up a bombardment to cover the drop troops' withdrawal. The shells and missiles from the ships plummeting onto Scopius, barely fifty yards from the Elysians. As the last drop troops left Scopius, the fleet pounded the facility with torpedoes and broadsides until the asteroid was shattered. The bombardment continued, smashing the fragments of Scopius into smaller and smaller pieces. Even then, no one was sure if the sarcophagus had been destroyed. For the last three hundred years, a wide area centred on the remains of Scopius has been declared Purgatus, and Imperial Navy patrols ensure the quarantine is not breached. Prince and the 22nd Elysians were exonerated of all responsibility and later went on to garner great fame and respect in the Catalan Crusade, during which the colonel was eventually promoted to war master. Armageddon Orc Hunters in the years following the defeat of Orc warlord Gaskell Thracker, the world of Armageddon began the long process of rebuilding its shattered hives and defences. The Orc army had been destroyed, but due to the unique spore-based reproductive system of the Orc race, infestations of greenskins continued to plague Imperial forces. In response to this, the head of the ruling military council of Armageddon, General Kurov, conducted several xenocidal campaigns, to destroy such infestations throughout the equatorial jungles of Armageddon and the ice world of Kosin. The forces involved in these battles suffered extremely high losses and many units were reduced to below a tenth of their operational strength. Rather than disperse these soldiers to other regiments, General Kurov decided to harness the valuable experience the survivors had gained and form them into a number of specialised orc hunting regiments. Soldiers from Dozens of different planets, and with almost no common culture, were now merged into specialised extermination regiments. The main area of operations for these units would be in the depths of Armageddon's jungles, where orcs continued to proliferate despite regular purges. These feral orcs proved to be extremely adept at fighting within the jungle environment, and frustratingly difficult to engage in a decisive battle. The orc hunters therefore built Cerbera Base in the middle of the jungle, providing them with a forward staging area and extensive training facilities. The sweltering heat and brutal training regimen soon earned the base the nickname of Helltown. The Orc Hunter's training included a broad array of new techniques to learn and master, such as demolition, escape and evasion, survival and intelligence work. The trainee soldiers of the Orc Hunters were expected to become experts in all the weapons and tactics used in the hunting of Orcs and jungle warfare. The guardsmen who survived the training were rewarded with the badge of the Orc Hunters, a small metal pin with an Orc skull emblem. This became the regimental symbol, 
and the source of their unofficial name, the Skull Takers. The Battle of Helltown. The kind of fighting involved in rooting out orcs breeds a different kind of soldier, one who fights with a savagery and low cunning almost equal to that of the Greenskins. The Orc Hunters were quick to carve themselves a bloody reputation, halving the number of orc raids within a month. Their battles were fought at close quarters, and the Orc Hunters were to take part in some of the bloodiest actions in the years between the Second and Third Armageddon Wars. As a result, units from other regiments were frequently posted to Helltown to learn from the Orc Hunter instructor sergeants. However, the Orc Hunters were regarded with disdain by other more illustrious regiments who view them as little better than vermin exterminators. This situation came to a head in 984M41 when units from the Pyron Dragoons were assigned a tour of duty in Helltown for jungle warfare training. The rough demeanour, insubordinate behaviour and coarse language of the Orc Hunters disgusted the blue-blooded Dragoons and they abandoned their posts returning to their base around Infernus Hive. The Dragoons had been responsible for patrolling zones to the west of the base, and as night fell, orc lobber shells began exploding within the wire. A huge force of orcs had approached unseen through the gap in the patrols and now attacked Helltown with terrifying ferocity. Troops sprinted to man the defences, but it was too late. The Greenskins were already within the perimeter. The orcs pushed deep into the camp, and overran the few defenders before being checked by heavy fire from a secondary defensive line of bunkers and foxholes. Time and time again, the orcs assaulted the defences, and each time they were driven off by deadly accurate laser fire. As the orcs prepared to attack once more, heavy monsoon rain began, turning the ground into a quagmire of deep mud and collapsing several sandbagged bunkers. Visibility dropped to less than 15 metres, and this enabled the orcs to bring up rockets which destroyed the more heavily fortified bunkers. The rain flooded foxholes and trenches, and the battle degenerated into a sprawling, mud-caked melee. Explosions and flashes of laser fire lit up the night as reinforcements were rushed in from other sectors of the camp. Hundreds of dead orcs littered the ground before the Imperial defenders, but still they came on. The scale and savagery of the orc attack was threatening to break the orc hunter's line, and something drastic was required to prevent a massacre. In a potentially suicidal move, Helltown's commanding officer, Colonel Pertinax, ordered the base's heavy mortars to begin shelling the rear of the Orc force and to gradually walk their fire towards his own men. The ground rocked as rounds smashed into the Orcs, wiping out whole mobs in the opening barrage. Dozens more were shredded as deafening explosions marched through the Orcish horde and dropping dangerously close to the Imperial lines. But it seemed as though nothing could stop the Orcs. Then, a mortar shell, perhaps guided by the Emperor's own hand, landed square on the Orc war boss and obliterated him instantly. With their leader dead, the Orcs' courage was broken, and they turned to flee back into the jungle. Exhausted beyond words, the Orc hunters did not pursue and set about consolidating their defences, lest the Orcs attack again. For five uneasy hours, the Imperial troops remained on full alert, but the Orcs had had their fill of fighting for one night, and there were no more attacks. As dawn broke and the rain ceased, the extent of the slaughter became apparent. Over 3,000 decapitated Orc corpses were thrown in a mass grave before being thoroughly incinerated. The Battle of Helltown had been won, but it was a costly victory. Fully half the base had been destroyed in the fighting and 900 of the Orc Hunters were killed in action. In the recriminations that followed, the Orc Hunters accused the Pyrans of desertion, and the regiments have remained bitter rivals ever since the battle. And with that, Imperial citizens, I shall leave you suitably morally boosted. Ah, the Imperial Guard, or the, the Astra Militarum as they call them now, Always my favourites, and I hope you did enjoy this. Uh, like I mentioned, check the description and the pinned comment in the comments to find uh, the more detailed vids on some of the individual regiments I've mentioned, including the Vostroyan Firstborn, the Praetorian Guard, and uh, one on Cadians. 
some of these are very old now. They're some of the first videos I did, like about three or four years ago, probably. So they don't have the, the flair and skill that you've become accustomed to. But I think they're still decent. I did a lot of research into them. I did my best on them at the time. It's just the, um, it's not the content itself. It's the uh, presentation, which probably needs working on, which, which needed working on. I don't know. Anyway, definitely go and check them out. And definitely check out the uh, Sabbath Worlds video if you've never done that before. If you're new to the channel or you've just missed it, uh, the Sabbath Worlds was the first thing I did. And it's uh, a big series that I, it took a long time for me to finish. And I did as, the best I could with it. And uh, I hope you do enjoy it. Goes for the entire sort of basically the entire Gorn's Ghost novel series is based in the Sabbath Worlds Crusade, this big campaign. So it goes from the start of that campaign all the way to the current era. And yeah, it's well worth it. If you like Imperial Guard stuff, if you like 40k stuff, you'll get a lot of understanding about the Imperium works, particularly in these sort of big, big crusades, these big multi planet campaigns with multiple fleets and army groups and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, definitely go and check that out. And um, yeah, well, that's it really. Thanks for everybody supporting the channel. Your names are going by here as I ramble. And if you'd like to help me out, uh, please do consider using the links in the description and becoming a member by Patreon or Subscribestar or just on YouTube, becoming a YouTube member. It all helps me out. Please do like the video. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Share this to anyone you think might be interested in, in viewing it. Really appreciate that. Uh, a lot of this stuff is from really, 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 really old. Well, not that old. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to sound that old. You know what I mean? But like these are, they, these are like white dwarfs from. They're at least twenty years old. All of them, I think, pretty much. I think they're all at least twenty years old. Yeah, I've had to go through a lot of the archives to, to find a lot of these old magazines out. And uh, eBay's an amazing resource, isn't it? <laughs> so yeah, I remembered reading a lot of this stuff though. Like I knew this stuff was out there, and I was like, I've got to find it. I've got to find it. Because there's a lot of, because there's not on the internet either, because this is such old stuff and it's such niche stuff that it doesn't really exist on the internet. Some of it does. I did actually find some little sort of references to things like um, knocking around. People are aware of this, but yeah, I had to go deep and find the actual magazines and stuff like that and find all this stuff out. So I hope you have enjoyed this. And like I say, much more detailed stuff on some of, some of the other individual regiments in the pinned comment and in the description. Anyway, I will see you all again next time. Thank you all for watching. Apologies, this video has taken longer to get out than I thought. Life is, uh, I've got this baby <laughs> and I don't want to go on about it, but I've got a baby and it takes, every, everything takes longer now. Okay, so just bear with me. More stuff is coming, big stuff. I'm working on it. It's just, this takes a, it's, it's all, it all takes time. It all takes time. And there's only so many hours in the day. I'll see you later, boys. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye-bye.